Hello, I am Tina, and today I am reviewing two classic sci-fi post-apocalyptic books. We've got Earth's Last Citadel and Daybreak 2250 AD. So I'm just going to include both of these reviews here. One I filmed, uh, you know, about a month or so ago, so my hair's a bit different. <laughs> but the other one I filmed recently. So I hope you enjoy these. Let me know in the comments if you've read either or both of these and which one you prefer and what your favorite classic post-apocalyptic book is. And of course, it's Earth Abides. Everyone loves Earth Abides. But uh, let me know if it's something different. So uh, thanks. <laughs> Today I'm doing a book review of the classic science fiction book Daybreak 2250 AD by Andre Norton. This is a book from 1952, so that's 70 years ago, <laughs> from Ace Books. So this is going to be a pretty short review because while the book is entertaining and fun, there really isn't a lot to talk about. Nothing in it was particularly noteworthy and nothing made me mad, so that's good. First of all, what is Daybreak 2250 AD about? Forrest was a mutant. He did not know what drove him to explore the empty lands to the north, where the great skeleton ruins of the old civilization rusted away in the wreckage of mankind's hopes. But he could not resist the urging that led him through danger and adventure to the place where he faced the menace of the Star Men. Pardon me if my voice sounds weird because I'm still congested from the cold I had like last week. It's awful. Anyway, so yes, this book is post-apocalyptic, if you couldn't figure that out. It also checks off all the classic post-apocalyptic tropes of radiation-ravaged wasteland, mutants, more mutants, abandoned towns, new civilizations, and feral beasts. It's awesome. In terms of characters, though, Forrest is pretty typical of 1950s sci-fi. He strikes out on his own because his town doesn't like him because his mom was a plainswoman, and he's also, as they say, a mutant due to his hair color and that he can see in the dark. It's not explained how this mutation occurred. <laughs> in this world, there are collections of small societies, the mountain people where Forrest is from, the roving plains people, and the dark people who survived because during the nuclear bombardment, they were in airplanes and then they landed somewhere, but that area became uninhabitable. So now they're seeking to create a home in the plains as well. And that's where the kind of contention between the groups happens. They don't like one another. And this is part of the plot later on that is kind of, um, ties into the themes of kind of like rejuvenation after a collapse. This book was written at a time when we still had hope <laughs> for the future. So what spurs Forrest to go on this quest or adventure is that he was denied a spot as a star man, which is an explorer and a forager. And he's denied this due to his heritage. So he's kind of like, you know, screw that. And he takes off on his own. He's young. They don't really say how young he is, but I'm presuming he's like 20, even though in this book, he looks like he's like, I don't know, my dad's age. <laughs> For the first bit of the book, it's just him and his giant cat, Lura, but he soon meets a friend, Aris Kane, I think that's how you say it, who is pretty much the same as Fours, but he's a bit more fiery. They're both determined, tough young men, and I liked them, but they weren't very deep. The setting really is the best part. If you love wastelands, this is a classic depiction. So there's habitable land around all these cities, which pr presumably were where the bombs were dropped. And the cities are radiation zones, basically. They call them blue zones. And you can't go in there because you obviously die of radiation poisoning. Uh, there are parts, except fours can go... Not all cities are, irradi are irradiated or perhaps the radiation has died down. They don't really know. We don't really know. There are parts in the abandoned cities though and they're really fun. And there's quite a bit of action at the end that's, that's pretty good. The main antagonist in the story is the beast men who are essentially heavily mutated humans who have been, have descended to like a near primal state. And they also kind of look now like giant rats. <laughs> the writing is typical for the era. Uh, it's very much a linear plot that is heavy on description and not a lot of interior focus, but the ideas behind it are very solid. I didn't love the book, but I very much enjoyed the book. <laughs> I recommend it if you love post-apocalyptic stuff and don't mind kind of the dryness of, of a classic story like this. It moves at a pretty good pace for a book from 70 years ago. Today I am doing a classic sci-fi book review of C.L. Moore and Henry Kuttner's Earth's Last, Last? <laughs> Citadel. It's from 1943 from Ace Books. Look at this cover. It's so pretty. <laughs> As usual, I'll be doing a spoiler-free review of this book. 
So, Ursula Citadel is a post-apocalyptic novel with Nazis, like World War II Nazis. It was published in 1943, as I said, during the war. This 19... This 79-year-old book would be considered very slow and likely boring to most readers today. But as a piece of 40s culture, it's considerably action-packed, and I found it very interesting. What's it about? <clears throat> Four humans from the 20th century are hurled forward a billion, a billion years in time by a being from an alien galaxy. They have been brought to a dying Earth, to Carcassia, Earth's last citadel, where the mutated remnants of humanity are making their final stand against the monstrous creations of the fading world. Thrust in the middle of this desperate struggle for survival, the last humans search for a way to break their deadlock, break the deadlock in the Armageddon at the end of time. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> one thing I found fun was that C.L. Moore, Catherine Lucille, was one of the first women to write in the genre and paved the way for many other female writers in speculative fiction. She met Henry Kuttner, also a science fiction writer in his own right, in 1936 when he wrote her a fan letter, not knowing she was a woman, and they, I guess, developed a relationship and they married in 1940. That is the cutest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> If more rom-coms featured that kind of a meet-cute, I would probably watch them, but I don't. <laughs> I would more likely watch this. Anyway, this novel is not the most exciting, as it moves quite slow. The characters are kind of flat, and it's full of telling and not showing. But we have to remember this book was written when many people still rode to work on horses. It's pre-post... It's, it's, it's pre-post-modern. Like, it's not... <laughs> we can't expect the expanse around here from this. Anyway, did I enjoy it? Yes, I did. It's very easy to read and follow. The slow parts don't drag on too long, and I like the representation of women. The action scenes are quite thin, though. That, those, that part could have been a bit better. So, our main character, Alan, is the typical hero of this age. He's stalwart, he's strong, he's a war hero, and he's single. As such, he makes all the right, honorable choices. He falls in love, and he saves the day. You can expect this going in. This is not really a spoiler. The other characters, Karen, <laughs> an Axis spy, Mike Smith, a Nazi, who is always referred to in the narration as Mike Smith, and not just Mike, and Dr. Colin, a Scottish intellectual who speaks in phonetic Scottish that was very annoying to read. They're more interesting than Alan, <laughs> as they aren't your typical characters in this type of novel. We don't get enough of them, though, to make them any more interesting. And I'm still curious as to why, like, they don't really explain this, but Mike Smith, I guess, was an American who decided to join the Nazis. I, I don't know. We don't, I, I was so fascinated by that, and I was curious about it, but they never delved into it. So I'm like, okay, I guess this is just accepted. <laughs> Okay. The plot isn't much to write home about, but it deals with aliens destroying the Earth, as I said, and some surviving raiders. Alan meets up with a woman, Avaya, who doesn't do much except provide information and an impetus to action. You know, this was expected, though, of the, of the, of the, uh, the, the, the main character's love interest. It usually happens. Overall, do I recommend the novel? I mean, not really. I think it's great as a relic, but it's not the best classic sci-fi I've ever read. It's quite slow. It's not very... It doesn't have anything kind of like overly interesting in it. A real hardcore classic sci-fi reader would enjoy it on a different level, and anyone who loves the 40s will probably like it, but I would not use it as an example to get someone into classic sci-fi. I liked it, but I have a very particular taste. <laughs> so yeah, um... It, it, I mean, I'm glad that I own it too. It's so cool. It's so pretty. Thanks for watching. And let me know in the comments if you've read Earth's Last Citadel and what your favorite classic post-apocalyptic book is. Because uh, I'd love to get more of a reading list. <laughs>